Father in heaven, we thank you again so much for uh, this, the, the, the blessings that you've given us today, Lord. Corinne and, and the other young people that have given their life to the Lord uh, a couple of Sabbaths ago. and uh, It's just tremendous, Lord. We thank you so much uh, what you're doing here, Lord. Um, and uh, I can't say enough. It gives us hope. It gives us assurance that you are in control, Lord. And again, we give you honor all the honor, praise, and glory. And Lord, as we uh, open up your word here to dive into it here, may you bless uh, each one here. May you uh, fill each one of us with your spirit and uh, draw us in harmony with you, Lord, this morning. And touch my lips, Lord, that uh, you would just use me as an empty vessel filled with you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I read a story the other day about a man who, uh, who always said, this is good to everything that ever happened to him. He said, this is good. It seems that he went with uh, his king on a hunting trip, and he loaded the guns. He was the man that loaded the guns, and the, ki and the king shot the guns. Evidently, this man loaded one gun wrong, and when it went off, uh, it's exploded in the barrel and it blew the king's finger off. So examining the situation, this man, uh, the friend of the king, he said, uh, as usual, this is good. Well, the king didn't want to hear that. <laughs> he, said, <laughs> he, said, he got mad and threw his friend in jail. He said, no, this is not a good thing. Well, about a year later, the king goes on another hunting trip to an area where there were cannibals. And these cannibals captured him and tied his hands and feet together and bound him to a stake because they were going to, they were going to cook him and eat him. And as they came near, they saw that the king's finger, one of his fingers was missing. Being superstitious, they never ate anyone who wasn't whole. So they set the king free. As the king returned home, he felt guilty about putting his friend in jail for a year. So he goes to the jail and he apologizes to his friend and he explained what happened to him. And he says, I'm very sorry for, for sending you to jail for so long. It was bad for me to do this. And his friend replied, no, this is a good thing. This is good. So the king says, what do you mean this is good? He says, how good, how good could it be that I sent my friend to jail for a year? And the friend says, uh, if I had not been in jail, I would have been with you. <laughs> <laughs> He'd have been the one to get ate, right? Yeah. This is a good thing. Uh, the fact is, friends, that we all go through trials and difficulties, don't we? We do. Uh, our scripture reading this morning was taken from Luke 22, verse 31. And if you'd like to turn there with me, you can, because we'll be spending some time there. There in verse 20, 20, uh, 31, Jesus said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about that. Have you ever thought about what goes through the sifting of wheat? It's a kind of a brutal process. First of all, the wheat is separated from its life-giving source. Then it's beaten with rods and trodden on by ox and sled. And then it's God-given protection is removed. And then it passes through a sieve where the valuable and useful is separated from that which is unprofitable. All this is done so that the farmer can say, this is good. In our scripture reading this morning, Jesus is warning Peter that he would go through a testing period. But Jesus apparently believed that this process was necessary for Peter. Think about it for a minute. God loves you with an amazing amount of love. He doesn't want anything bad to happen to you. Jeremiah 29 verse 11 says this, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you a future and a hope. God wants nothing but good for you and I. And God is in charge of all things, isn't he? 
or else he wouldn't be God, right? Nothing can happen to you unless he allows it. So if Satan is allowed to sift Peter, or you for that matter, then God had to have allowed it. And if he allowed it, and he loves you that much, it must be for your own good. We'll look at verse 31 again here. And I'll share it here again. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. We might have expected Jesus to say, Satan demanded permission to sift you like wheat, but I didn't let him. You know, I wish it had said that, but that's not what it says. Jesus allowed this brutal process in Peter's life, even though he loved Peter. And notice what Satan had to get, had to get permission there, didn't he? He said, Satan did more than just say please. And of course, I'm using the New American Standard version, and it says Satan demanded permission from God to target the apostle. Satan said more than please to God. In other words, he asked with a strong degree of insistence, and Satan demanded this permission from the sovereign Lord, from the God of the universe, for his own selfish and destructive agenda. The image, the image Jesus chose, that of sifting like wheat, is painfully graphic. The picture is of grain being removed from its life source, beaten and separated from its protection, and then sent through a sieve where the head of grain is taken apart. Our English uh, idiom of picking someone to pieces or taking someone apart has similar emotional force to it. Satan would like to bring Peter to ruin and leave him in, leave him in pieces, broken, exposing his lack of faithfulness. And Jesus did allow it. Follow on here in verse 32. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, and you, when once you have turned again, I think King James uses the word uh, um, repented or uh, converted, I mean. Thank you. Strengthen your brothers. Notice that Jesus here encouraged Peter by telling him, I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. While Satan acts as the cunning adversary, Jesus acts as the intercessor, the advocate of his people. Though Satan takes full advantage of Peter's human weaknesses and succeeds in temporarily derailing him, the evil one fails to fully destroy the apostle because Jesus intercedes for him. Yeah, that's a comfort to us. Every true believer in Christ has the assurance that Jesus continues to be our intercessory prayer warrior. Amen? Amen. Jesus believed that Peter is eventually going to be stronger from having gone through this. He says when you have turned back, not if, but when. Jesus sees that Peter can become, he sees what Peter can become, not just what Peter is, and he says, when you have turned back, strengthen your brethren. If you do a comparison between Luke's account of this event and Matthew's, you discover that Peter was ready to die for Jesus. In Matthew 26, verses 31 and 33, Jesus said, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. And Peter answered, and said to him, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. Nonetheless, temporary failure would result. Regardless of the Son of God's prayers for him, Peter would indeed fail. His human faithlessness would be revealed. But his failure would drive him back to his compassionate, restorative Savior. It would turn him back to Jesus Jesus remarks on that restoration and reconciliation before the fact here in Luke 22, verse 32. Here we see a picture of how God offers total forgiveness to those who would repent of the weakness and failures and turn to him. He knows our failure and still extends his hand graciously to
to the believer who trusts in him. God won't forsake us. If we trust in him, if we go to him, if we run to him in trials, when we're in trouble, he won't let us down. Think about all those examples that the Bible gives us of those who have been sifted like wheat. You know, probably the first person we think of is Job. How would you like to bend Job? You know, God essentially offered him up to Satan just to be tested. Job 1 verse 8, the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? You know, I don't know about you folks, but I don't think I want God going around bragging to the devil about, about me, do you, you know? Because uh, boy, what comes next? He essentially says to Lucifer, let's put Job to the test. And Job was sifted like wheat. Satan said, take away everything he has and he'll curse you to your face. And what do we expect that God would say to Satan? No, you can't do that. You can't have my servant Job. I love Job and I won't let you test him like that. Is that what God said though? No, he says, go ahead, take it all. But you can't touch his person. God gives Satan permission. And Satan reveals his destructive power. The sifting process begins. Job is removed from his life-giving source. All kinds of things happen to take away his trust in God. All ten of his children are killed. All of his wealth vanishes in one day. But Job recognizes that God is in charge of all things. And if this was happening to him, God is allowing it and praises God in spite of all that has happened. So how does Satan respond? He says, of course, Job still loves you, but take away his health and surely he will curse you to your face. So God says, no, that would be too much. You can't do that. Is that what God says? No. He says, go ahead, take his health, but you can't take his life. Friends, what do we expect from God? God, God doesn't always do what we think he should. You know, we might ask the question, why doesn't God prevent cancer? Why doesn't God prevent heart attacks and divorces and loss of jobs and loss of children? He lets Satan sift like wheat, that brutal process of separating the wheat from the chaff. And praise God that he says, yes, you can do that, but you can't take his life. Have you noticed that uh, Jesus' goal was always polar opposite of Satan's? Satan unlocked and unleashed his arsenal for Job's and Peter's destruction. But we must never forget that all his attacks are kept in check by the sovereign God who possesses all wisdom and has purposes that cannot be seen by us. Both Job's and Peter's faith would fail for a time, but not be completely destroyed. Jesus told Peter that after that sifting process, that he would be restored to the Savior. Peter would be equipped to strengthen your brothers. Satan's diabolical work would indeed be used for God's higher, holier purposes. There are many more examples of this sifting process in the Bible. There's the story of Joseph, who was sold by his brothers into slavery. There's the widow of Nain, who lost her husband and then her son, who was her only source of livelihood, who also died. There's the story of Naomi and Ruth. Esther and Mordecai, the woman whose husband died and left her with a pile of debt, and so many others who were allowed to go through one tragedy after another. Let's go back to the story of Peter here. Jesus told Peter that he would deny him three times before the rooster would crow. But notice what happened before Peter's, den Peter's denial. Matthew's account tells us that uh, they went to the Garden of Gethsemane 
And Jesus took Peter, James, and John a little further into the garden. And notice what he said to them. In Luke 22, verse 40, Jesus said, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. But what happened? Well, they fell asleep. Matthew 26, 40, 41. Notice that he specifically said to Peter, he said, Why aren't you praying? I warned you that Satan wanted to sift you like wheat. I warned you that you were going to fall asleep, uh, fall away. I warned you that you needed to pray, and here you are sleeping. I don't know about you, but I usually say something foolish when I'm not uh, guarding my words. If I do something foolish, it's because I'm not paying attention to what's going on around me. If I fall into temptations because I haven't been praying for the Lord's protection and deliverance from evil. You know, if you, when I get into trouble, I look around and I'm thinking, hmm, I haven't been spending much time with the Lord, you know. I haven't been praying, I haven't been reading, I haven't been studying. And here I am. Thought I could go on my own again. I don't know about you, but I would not choose for myself to be sifted. I do not like trouble and difficulty in my life. But notice that after have gone through his own sifting process, this is what Peter tells us. Turn with me to uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1, uh, verses 6 and 7. You're probably there before me. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's pretty powerful. James 1, verses 2 and 3. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. I ask you the question this morning, what are Peter and James telling us? They're telling us this is good. We may not like it. It might be painful, but God is allowing this sifting process. God is allowing this trial and difficulties into your life, my life, because it's for our good. Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So we see, we see the controversy, don't we here? We see this battle between Satan and Jesus. Satan wants to sift us like wheat. He wants to destroy. He wants to ruin us, bludgeon us, kill us, tear us apart. But God allows it to mold and fashion us into the image of Christ. He loves us and wants the best for us. And sometimes the best thing for us is to go through that brutal process of being sifted. And when you are sifted, all the chaff, all the impurities are all removed. And all that remains is pure grain. Amos chapter 9 verse 9 tells us, For surely I will command... And will sift the house of Israel among all nations, as grain is sifted in the sieve. Yet not the smallest grain shall fall to the ground. You see, friends, when God allows you to be sifted, he gives all of the chaff and all of the stubble and all the impurities to Satan. But he keeps for himself the wheat. There is a tale of a story of an old farmer who had worked his crops for many years. And one day his horse ran away. Upon hearing that news, his neighbors came over to visit. 
just to tell him how such bad luck he had. They were sympathetic about it, but, well, maybe, the farmer replied. The next morning, the horse returned, bringing with it three other wild horses. Well, the neighbors come right over again, just to tell him how wonderful this was. Well, maybe, he replied. The following day, his son tried to ride one of those untamed horses and was thrown and broke his leg. Well, you know, the neighbors, they come right over, and they there to give their sympathies, you know, and, and uh, tell him about his misfortune. The old farmer said, maybe. The day after, the military officials came to the village to draft young men into the army. Seeing that the son's leg was broken, they passed him by. And the neighbors, they'd come over to congratulate the farmer on how well things had turned out. And the old farmer says, well, maybe. You see, brothers and sisters, maybe this is good. Are any of you today hurting? Is something going wrong in your life today? Have you been faced with challenges in your life? Have things been going in a way you didn't expect? You know, I'll tell you, God's still in charge, isn't he? Amen. Yes, he is. And maybe this is good. Maybe God has you right where he wants you. Can you trust God this morning that uh, it'll all work out for you? Can you come to him this morning and say, Lord, I, I trust you, and Lord, I want to give it all to you today. Is that your desire in your hearts today?